Welcome to Pipeline Conversations, a machine learning podcast by ZenML. This week, I spoke with Matt Squire, the CTO and co-founder of Fuzzy Labs, where they help partner organizations think through how best to productionize their machine learning workflows. Matt and Fuzzy Labs are also behind the awesome open source MLOps GitHub repo, where you can find all of the options for an open source MLOps stack of your dreams. Matt has been an enthusiastic early supporter of the work we do at ZNML, so it was really amazing to get to talk to him and get his take on the many experiences he's had seeing how ML is done out in the field. My name is Matt. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Fuzzy Labs. We're based in Manchester in the UK, and we consult on MLOps, and specifically We specialize in the open source MLOps tools. For me personally, I come at MLOps very much from an engineering perspective, more than a data science perspective, because most of my own background is in in software engineering. Um, When we started the company three years ago, we had quite a broad remit. So we uh, were, were building AI and ML driven software solutions for a variety of use cases including in the medical industry, in, um, in uh, venture capital, and recently for um, a company that has an NFT marketplace. So, of course, this is quite a, a broad spectrum of, of things. As we gained more experience working on these projects, we kind of started to zero in on the core problem of productionization and all of the infrastructure that sits around that, which is why we've gone to this, this specialization in MLOps and specifically open source MLOps, which is where we believe there is a there aren't enough people talking about, there aren't enough people um, really thinking about. So that's where we want to really niche. So maybe let's dig into that. What have been what I guess is at the the center of this core that you're dealing with? What are the the pain points that you're you're there to address? Yeah, sure. Um, because th- this is. Definitely a fascinating time in, in machine learning because because of the, the growth of MLOps, precisely because of that. I think when we look at, th- there's a set of things which machine learning models have in common with productionizing traditional software. But when you dig into those de- the details of each of those things, there's also differences that, that account for why MLOps is special versus just saying it's just DevOps let's say. So things like uh, version control, as an example, in the software industry, we're all quite happy to say, of course, we need to version control our code. Well, when we're training models, we also have data. So we need to version control that too. The thing with data is it's, it's not quite as simple as version controlling code. Version control over code is more or less a solved problem. We've all pretty much all standardized on Git. But with data... You know, it's it's much larger. The artifacts are much larger than pure pieces of code. It's big. It's complex. It's not trivial to diff data, um, and and so that's you know, in terms of version control, then we need a set of new tooling that can address the unique characteristics of data while also doing what Git does for code, which is provide a way for people to collaborate effectively, the central source of truth, the ability to go back in time and see the previous state of things or if we look at another aspect of traditional software development we might want automated build and deploy of things so that translates to automatic training and deployment of our models CICD the the thing is that model training of course is resource intensive it's not merely compiling a program and dockerizing it you know we need to run these training jobs potentially for hours even longer with large amounts of compute resources. So then we have to worry about where we do it. We have to worry about coordination. We have to, in addition to all of that, deal with another thing, which is very unique to data science, which is experimentation. Software development doesn't really have this this notion. Sure, we we write, maybe we do test-driven development. So I I could write a test that um, represents a, a trait that I want for my code, and then I write the code, see if the test passed is fine. But that's something I can do very in a very quick feedback loop locally. 
and I don't really care about the experiments afterwards. All I care is that my function meets these requirements and they are represented in the test. But with, with uh, machine learning, we don't really know where we want to get to or rather how to get there. We, we know where, where we want to get to. But we don't quite know how to get there. If we knew how to get there, we'd just write code for it after all. Um, and so we end up having to do all of this experimentation where we try different variations of premises, different algorithms, different data sets. Somehow we need to keep track of all of this because we need to move in a, dire in a direction of progress towards a model that is better ultimately. And, and that comes back down to we need tools to enable people to track these things and collaborate effectively and see what's been done in the past. Um, and then yes, again, another, another thing that comes up when we dig into this train deploy process, aside from experiments is tracking of assets. So there's a whole bunch of things we need to track in machine learning that we don't really care. So we don't really have a notion of in traditional software development models, features, metrics, evaluations, and we have stores for all of these things. Uh, I recently enjoyed reading an article by Michal Eric, which was um, about the state of MLOps now. And he has this quote that says, um, the machine learning community is particularly creative when it comes to making synonyms for database, which is kind of what all these things are, right? But but nevertheless, we, we all this stuff that we need to keep track of. Um, and then my final, <laughs> The final one is monitoring, where again, traditional software has made a lot of progress in terms of monitoring infrastructure. And we can, it's reasonable to think about a generic approach to monitoring for software, i.e. we say we have a bunch of web services, they're heterogeneous, they all do different things, but ultimately we care, are they running? Are they throwing errors? Is, are the rest endpoints slow? This, these kinds of things. But when it comes to a model, if I want to say, well, I've observed an output or an input to my model, is that observation likely? Is it reasonable? Is it an outlier? Well, I need to know something about the statistical distribution of the data or the, the model um, inferences to be able to answer that question, which means my monitoring solution needs to know about my model. So again, it's, um, it's completely new, new space. So to kind of circle back to the the question, I guess, it's that there are, you know, and what we've discovered through doing the, the various um, machine learning driven projects that we've we've been on in the last few years, there are these common challenges which go above and beyond the challenges you would see just in software development, the DevOps challenges. These are new challenges which demand new tools new cultures, new, new processes, new, new ways of thinking. So the complexity that does exist, and I don't think anyone would deny that MLOps is kind of a complex domain, at least in the way it currently exists. Does this come just because it's like you were saying, inherently there's more going on than traditional software engineering, or is some of that complexity have to do that we're kind of in an immature field or an immature stage of development of, of, of the I'm inclined to think it's more the latter while there are definitely things that are necessarily complex in machine learning like the, the fact that ultimately when you train a model you're saying well uh, like I said before you don't I don't really know how to get to where I'm going but I'm going to throw some data at an algorithm and it's going to figure it out for me that is necessarily complex because it's very difficult to figure out, well, what's this algorithm doing to understand when we get such and such accuracy, why and whether we could do better and how we could do better. So in that sense, I think there's some inherent complexity in machine learning. But I think the complexities in MLOps have a lot more to do with the immaturity of the tooling. Um, you know, I mean, we are, what are we? We're witnessing a Cambrian explosion of tools here. And it was looking back at, at DevOps when DevOps was a new thing. It seems like it took several waves, successive waves of tooling to get to the level of maturity we see now in DevOps. I think it's the same in, in MLOps. I think it's that that's simply 
it's simply a symptom of where we are in, in maturity. And I, I guess along along similar lines, before we get into talking about the, the tooling aspect, are there are there aspects of this that can be addressed by I don't know, some kind of cookie cutter template, whether it's for how you do your projects or, or indeed the tooling, uh, leaving the, the, the tooling to one side, maybe. Is that a, a useful way of thinking about it? I feel like you've, you, you're have you reading my script to some, to some extent here. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, I don't think that a cookie cutter template really, really works. Um, and so some of that, I, you said, don't, don't talk about the tooling. So I'll leave that to one side. I guess the the issue is that I, I can't picture, if I look at a traditional piece of software, sure, I can picture a getting started with a REST service, but that gives you 1% of what you need for your specific thing. I can't picture a cookie cutter thing that gives you a web service that can then do all of the variety of things that you'd need a web service to do in a, in a real business case. And so for the same reason, I, I don't think it works. I think it's, it's helpful to say, okay, well, here's a good way to organize your project into different directories and how to manage it on Git. Here's a nice workflow for, for doing it all. But if, if we mean cookie cutter, like here's a machine learning model template, now just tweak a few things and you'll have what you need. No, I, I don't, I don't really think that that, that works. Um, and this question about cookie cutter templates also leads into why we care about open source, which is ultimately that when you look at the various proprietary platforms out there, they're all promising a almost a turnkey approach to machine learning. You know, you pay for this platform, you give it your data, it will train you a model and all of your problems are solved. We don't think it's as simple as that, um, which is why we, we champion building something for your use case rather than just using something off the shelf. Well, maybe let's dive into the, the tooling side of things then. How do you assess where we are right now? Yeah, as, as I said, we need to remember how new MLOps is. Um, but I think anyone, who, like anyone who's been on this journey of trying to figure out where do I get started with MLOps they're familiar with the feeling of being overwhelmed by how much stuff there is out there and not really knowing where to start, you know, which things do I need first and how do I compare one tool to another? This situation is also not helped by the fact that a lot of tools overlap in functionality rather than doing say one thing well, but then it's similar with, you know, you compare it with DevOps, which I think is the best comparison in terms of, technology movements as well as in terms of functionality it took a while to get to the the maturity we see now um and i fortunately i was i just started my software career actually as devops took off so i kind of got to witness the transformation and the the pain and um some of the, the barriers and and so forth to adopting MLOps and some of the early, uh, sorry, DevOps, uh, some of the early iterations. And it feels very much like MLOps is at that very, very nascent stage. I think looking at the space of tools, um, there seems to be three broad categories. We have our proprietary closed source tools. They're often subscription based. They have their merits, certainly. They are you know, low maintenance tools, they're easy, they're safe. They very much fit into the nobody ever got fired for buying IBM kind of mindset of, and, and, and I can well imagine therefore big, you know, big corporations that are perhaps risk averse might be inclined to say, oh, okay, there's this platform out there. They have some really good demos. It looks great. So we'll just pay for that. That will do our machine learning. I think where that kind of thinking falls short is that often the the example use cases the demos are relatively trivial often it's academic examples or very basic examples that don't come that close to a real you know real world business productionized machine learning use case uh, 
and then opposite spec opposite end of the spectrum then you've got your fully open source tools and there you can pick exactly what you need and combine it build build the solution that that makes sense for you now and for me that is the most future proof way to approach mlops partly because open source tools allow you of course to pick what you need from everything that's available but also it's future proof because as we've said the 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 tooling we have now is probably not the tooling that we're going to have in five or ten years some things will still be around but we're going to see successive waves of, of new tools and having the flexibility to be able to upgrade and change things later on as new things come around come around just seems to seems to make the most sense i think it's the best bet for the future um and then kind of somewhere in the middle of, of those two categories of proprietary versus open source we've got these these things that i like to call faux open source faux open source <laughs> these are things that they say they're open source but they're not they're not really yeah, there's some special license uh, you know that like the server side public license and things like that uh, things derived from that rather the open source initiative have a nice article on why these kinds of licenses don't count as open source and fundamentally it comes down to they don't mandate the same kind of freedoms that you get with a genuine open source license um or alternatively some of these open source tools maybe they they have something that's that's open source that looks good on the surface but you dig into it and some of the features some of the advanced features are missing you know a good test would be to look at you you look at something that i mean let's say it's a a training platform that says it's open source and then you ask yourself okay well if i did a pull request and i added um let's say user authentication to this platform something an enterprise might care about would the company behind it decline that pull request because it competes with something that they want to offer commercially so that that kind of thing to me is a, a clue that this is not really an open source project it's not really um open source ethos so we spent a fair bit of time exploring this space as well and started off with that feeling of, of being overwhelmed that i mentioned earlier ended up with this um this list curated list of open source tools which is called awesome open source ml ops which you can check out on github but that um kind of tries to neatly categorize all of the open source tools that we know about into their different areas of, of implementation. So that, that picks up a lot of traction. Um, and I guess what was quite remarkable about that is that it's just how well people responded to it. You know, the looking at the, the space of open source tools overall, these proprietary tools get a huge amount of people's attention because they have huge marketing budgets. But when you talk to people doing data science, people doing machine learning, about open source tools that the there's the response is is um really quite stark it's that the people who actually build these things they see the value of of open source they see why why it makes sense why um why it's the right bet for the future why it makes sense for what they're trying to build now uh, so the, the the github repo you mentioned is is really interesting and certainly there's a kind of a, a good number of options for people, but there's a very clear disparity between, you know, all of these, uh, I'm sure many of the people listening will have seen these maps of MLOps tools, which is just, it's so zoomed out, you can't read anything anymore. There's a thousand icons on a page or something like that. And the number of them that you've identified as kind of best in class open source is like a tiny fraction of that. Why do you think that is? So part of the reason for that is simply that there's a lot of tools out there and we haven't heard of most of them. I think that there's, that's definitely, there's definitely an aspect of that in there, but there's more to it than that. We've deliberately chosen tools that seem to have a decent amount of adoption, a decent amount of support and community built around them. And ideally open source tools that still have some kind of commercial backing behind them. Because when we go to work with our customers to deliver MLOps consultancy services, and we recommend 
this tool and that tool to solve their problems, we want to be able to give them some assurance that this thing isn't going away. You know, just because it's open source, don't worry, it's not going to disappear. It's not some fly by nice operation. So that's a lot of the motivation for what we pick and what we recommend to our customers that, and, and what's in that repo, which are one and the, one and the same. Um, a lot of the motivation of that is, is that commercial backing and having a decent community around it. I think something that you mentioned it a little bit earlier as well, that when evaluating tools in the space, it's often quite difficult to, to really uncover like what a tool is good at because so many of the tools claim to be taking care of the whole problem. And even, you know, we talk about even something relatively focused as data versioning, where you have DVC, which is kind of a leader in that space, but DVC also steps in the space of experiment tracking as well. And yes, it's difficult for, yeah, for outsiders coming to this space and you to be able to disentangle all of this as well. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a huge problem right now. And you know, if we picture one of those, I think we have all seen them and you alluded to earlier, these maps of the MLOps space, they're huge. They've got lots of boxes on them and a huge amount of overlap between functionality. It's the opposite of the, the Unix philosophy that we all know and love, which says that you should have a tool that's good at one thing and one thing only, and you can combine these tools to create more complex pieces of functionality. And that's where where I'd like to see things go and where I imagine things will go. When we're looking at these kinds of tools, let's take DVC, for example, we really want to say, well, what's the core thing this is good at? We'll use it for that. So DVC we use for data version control. We don't use DVC's pipelining features beyond what is mandatory. And But, but we're not really using the pipeline features as a machine learning pipeline. You know, We're not using it as an experiment tracker. We're using something else for that again. And you know, similarly with ZenML, it's say ZenML is really good at pipelines. That's and that's what we use it for, and everything else connects to it. I mean, I suppose that that gives us quite a nice bridge, right, to to ZenML because you know, if if we want every tool to be good at one thing and we want to use it for the thing it's best at, that is the that's the same philosophy that um, we see in ZenML as well. That it's a really good pipelining tool that connects to lots of other things. And I suppose in the end, um, the general trend will be towards the tools which are doing many things will double down on the things where they actually find people using the most. And then it won't necessarily be the case that everyone always tries to do everything. There will be some kind of consolidation there. I hope so. Yeah. And honestly, this should be a load off the mind of, of tour maintainers. I think if, if everybody can kind of figure out this is the thing we're really good at, so let's not worry about the rest. That focus will, will really drive the industry forward. We've been talking in kind of general terms about stack and tool choices that, that people can make for machine learning in production. Can we expect some kind of tooling consolidation or some better sense of the right abstractions for thinking about this stack over time or is the entropy just uh, a result of the fact that machine learning is very context specific and there will always be a variation in, in how these things get put together? I don't think that the, the context specificity of machine learning is really any different than context specificity of software development, which is a good thing because then I, I would think that, yeah, we, we can come up with sensible abstractions and standards to operate with. I mean, I do wonder where where it goes with, say, the cloud providers, because right now, Google, Amazon, Microsoft all have added in the last year or so, they've all added MLOps capabilities to their machine learning platforms. But from what I've seen, they really fall short. But I wonder if ultimately cloud providers start to adopt open source tools and, you know, so maybe just as everybody adopted Kubernetes as a container orchestration system, and now every cloud provider offers Kubernetes as a service, a managed service, you almost wonder if, if you'll see, I don't know, ZenML as a managed service. Could that be a thing in the future? So tools like ZenML represent exactly those kinds of abstractions that we would, that we'd all like to see. 
they allow a data scientist to express a machine learning pipeline in terms of what they want it to do, but they don't say how I want to execute it and what things I want to use in combination with it. They give you the choice to to make that later. They kind of separate the definition from the execution. And so, yeah, so I, I do wonder if, uh, so I do think that abstractions and standards will come about that apply universally. And I'm, I'd kind of bet that cloud providers start to cotton on to certain, certain tools and they start to become, you know, these as a, as a managed service offerings. Yeah, we did have one guest a few episodes ago who suggested one kind of uh, future where essentially a big player just consolidates by buying up a number of best practices tools that cover all of the the full spectrum of things and then just puts them under one roof. I, I guess I could see that scenario. I'm not sure whether it feels like an ideal world scenario, but you mentioned standards and, and best practices there. That's something which I, I see is going alongside the tooling question. What work needs to happen there? Where is the drive for con- kind of consolidating and addressing the need for these standards and best practices um, going to come from? I suppose there's two kinds of standards, aren't there? There's technical standards, which would have to do with things like how do tools interoperate or standards for representing model serving, things of things of that nature. Um, but I think the more the more interesting idea of standards, the more interesting notion of standards and practices has more to do with the the way we work as people, the way we collaborate together on projects and you know that that plus the tooling is is what is what's at the core of of mlops but i think there there's quite a long way to go in terms of figuring out those working practices so what i mean is uh, data science is such a specialized field and so you have a let's say you have a data scientist who has trained a model and you want to monitor that model what you don't really want is ideally you don't want the data scientist to be responsible for monitoring the model because that's quite a lot of infrastructure so you would like to say okay well my infrastructure specialist will set up the monitoring ah but but now the problem is that you need to understand enough about data science to at least get what is this model doing what's it supposed to be doing so that you can monitor for things you you can monitor for drift or bias what are the failure point. points and right so on. yeah yeah so i i see the the barrier there in in just figuring out where that handover is how we how we communicate things between um between disciplines so that the so that people can play to their strength you know the infrastructure specialist can figure out the infrastructure for monitoring without having to be a, also be a data scientist and the data scientists can focus on producing really good models without having to also be an, an infrastructure expert. I don't so know if that, does that guess, answer the question? Yes, uh, I mean, it, it goes towards it. So I guess you don't see much of a, a place or even the idea of the full stack data scientist who's doing things really end to end and managing the, the entire life cycle. You're arguing against that? I don't know that I'm arguing against it. I just don't see right now that we have the the necessary amount of abstractions to be able to do it. And I guess alongside alongside this, whatever is driving us towards those best practices, we also have kind of a whole series of incentives which are coming down the road in, in the form of regulation, which obviously will affect certain industries more than others. And I guess certain industries are already affected by this but would that help does there need to be more input from the practitioner's side in terms of how that's going to come out so when you say regulation what's an example of of the kind of thing you have in mind like eu the eu is is coming out later this year i think or earlier next year with a kind of a whole series of uh, guidance in terms of practices around AI and models and so on, just like in, I don't know, in the banking sector, it's assumed that you'll be able to provide lineage for every model and, and 
and so on, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I see. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a very interesting area about which I don't know a huge amount, but I, I suppose a lot of it is. I, I my instinct is a lot of this is is a tooling problem, though. Mm -hmm. It's being able to have the well, no, I suppose it's two things. It's having the tools that allow you to do what the regulations require, but also awareness of what the regulations mean in terms of how you actually work. And I imagine that's an area that, that needs more work than the tooling because I, I don't, I mean, I've not spoken to any day scientists about regulation before. It would be interesting to, to have that conversation, but my, my, what I would guess is that, you know, software development, software developers are not legal experts and data scientists are not legal experts. So to expect people to be aware of exactly what's required of them when they're building their models, when they're training, uh, when they're monitoring and so forth, even if the tooling in principle enables them to do it in practice the level of awareness people have of, of what's actually required of them is probably not where it needs to be. I imagine it will maybe resemble something a little bit like the effect that GDPR had on the web engineering sphere, where suddenly overnight things changed and you had to become aware of personal information and, and so on. And then there was this whole kind of tooling thing which emerged around it. But I just, I feel like since data and ML are so intertwined, I imagine it might be a bit more, it's not a question of just adding a, a, a module or something on top of what you're doing. Yeah, and the curious thing that, that I took from from that history is that you have well-meaning regulation that makes sense as, as regulation. Of course, we want to protect people's privacy. Of course, we need to, to take these measures to you know give people informed consent about how their data is being used or the cookie law informed consent about cookies but then when it's actually implemented people don't the people implementing it don't care enough to be able to to give it the attention it needs so that that seems to be what happened with um on the last round that you mentioned and how much of figuring out, I guess, a way forward for particularly in terms of improving things for practitioners, how much do we need to address kind of the, the education part of it? Because at least till now, more or less, the focus on ML education has been like all on the model iteration piece and relatively little on the wider life cycle on the kind of the engineering practices around there and it's only i guess in the last year or so that you start to see some courses and some kind of products and materials being being published and put out there is is that an issue is that just where we are with things i mean education is is a huge problem with with mlops and it's not helped by just how many tools there are and well, firstly, how many proprietary vendors there are who don't want you to know about the internals. They want you to see a an abstraction. So their their message is use our platform and then there's there's no problem, which doesn't really educate anybody about anything. It's just, well, we'll use our platform. And, th and then, of course, you're tied into the platform. But at the same time, it's not helped by the fact that the tools that are out there, there's so many of them and they do so many different things. There's so much overlap. Um, so I, I'd, yeah, I think that the ideal we need to get to is where there's, there is a, a somewhat de facto standard set of both abstractions, tools, and practices so that at least the set of things people need to learn is small enough. And at least you can teach it in the right order as well, because that seems to be another, another difficulty. Um, I had a conversation with someone recently who said, I was talking to them, in fact, about pipelines and about ZenML. And they said, well, it sounds like I probably don't need this at first. At first, I can just play around in Jupyter and then add it on later. I said, no, I, I don't think that's right, actually. I think you need it from the start. And actually, when you see when you see how simple it is to set up and, and use and build a pipeline, you'll kind of realize that, that the barrier you thought would be there to in terms of implementing it isn't really there. And the benefits of having it early on will 
be pretty clear because you 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 set yourself up for success later on so it's things like that of the education gap is not just knowing what tools are out there and what they can do but knowing what you need and when what's the priority for you and what are the kind of the trade-offs i guess of the, uh, the trade-offs choices. as well yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I definitely would recommend people check out the the series of guides you guys have been writing on the fuzzy labs site there yeah pretty no nonsense straight to the point kind of good guides like i think definitely there's a lot to recommend people taking the time to just simplify the space a bit for people and just explaining if you want a good default particularly in the open source space like you should probably head in this direction or yeah 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 i mean that that's definitely what we're what we're aiming for here and in all of our communication really it's it's um as much clarity as we can possibly give about the tools, the trade-offs between these tools, practices, and and so forth. Are there any parts of kind of the reality of doing production ML, which we haven't talked about? I'm thinking in particular of the the way that teams work around producing producing things in this space. Is that handled by the way that the tooling landscape currently has things? One thing I've noticed is that People don't talk about collaboration enough, in my view. They, when you see people talk about tools, they talk about technological features. So DVC is a tool for tracking your data. You can version your data, you can go back in time. And as technical people, we can see the technical merits of that. We understand why it's useful to be able to go back in time. But there's not so much emphasis on what it also provides in terms of collaboration it gives everybody on the team a place where they can acquire the data from so that we're not worrying about how how do I get the data on my machine? You know, if, if I've just joined a data science team or who's got the current version, you know, how, how do we pass it around? We've solved that problem. Or um, how do we ensure that there is one source of truth ultimately, that there's not two or three different versions of this data set on different people's computers. There's one source of truth that we can all build from. And it's similar for all of the tooling. And certainly where, as we've been writing these, these guides that you mentioned, we've been quite conscious to emphasize for each kind of tool, each area of implementation, what are the features in terms of what of collaboration, of what it allows you to do. Um, sorry, that, that sentence isn't going anywhere. <laughs> so what we've been conscious of as we've been writing these guides is emphasizing for each category of tool what are the collaborative features those tools give you as well as the technical features yeah i've I've been working on a side project of my own and as i work through the the pieces of developing the model and so on i've been encountering along the way all of the various options and choices and so on that that i could make at any particular point depending on well depending on all Whole, whole bunch of different things and so in part because i don't kind of a, a new entrant to this space like it's been interesting to to have to to figure out those trade-offs along the way well as best as what i i can although i'm not collaborating with anyone but but still yeah there's there's a lot of choices one has to make at, at least at the moment yeah and, and for the same reason that nowadays even if you start a, a hobby project the first thing you do is create a repo on github right even if you're not collaborating with someone else, because you're collaborating with yourself, firstly, chronologically, um, as in you want to know how you got there and you might want to go back later on. Uh, but you might collaborate with people later on. And, you know, by doing it that way, you're set up for it from the beginning. And I think the same applies for valid state science as well. So is there, and obviously things are going to, to change as just in general, the, the field develops, but for the moment, uh, have you kind of settled on a rough idea of what an ideal MLOps stack looks like? Yeah, we, we have a, what I would call a pretty, an, an opinionated idea of what that looks like today. So there's two ways to look at it. There's archetypally, what are the thick kinds of things you need? So you need data versioning, you need model training, automation, uh, deployment, monitoring, what fills those spaces right now for us, we like DVC for data version control. We think ZNML makes a huge amount of sense as the place for defining pipelines. 
And one of the things that I like about ZenML is that it separates the uh, definition of the pipeline from the execution, which has the benefit that not only can I defer decisions about certain pieces of technology till later on, but also I can change my mind later on. So to, to give that a little bit more color, I might say for today, Kubeflow is a decent tool for running machine learning pipelines, but I don't want to write machine learning pipelines in Kubeflow. So I'll use ZenML for that, run them on Kubeflow. And maybe later on, I want to run it on something else. So maybe I have a customer that says, actually, we'd love to run our pipelines on Azure ML. And that's fine. And I think I saw in the recent release that Azure ML, is that right? Now supported? Uh, yes, for, yeah. for, yeah, for specific yeah. steps. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, that takes us to that data version control pipelining and orchestration where we don't have such a strong opinion, but things like Kubeflow, Airflow, or the cloud-based AI platforms all provide good options for a for actually executing the pipeline. For model serving, I, I think it's harder to be opinionated because the options depend very much on use case, but we like Selden Core as an option. We also like Bento, a few others that we've, we've been playing around with. For monitoring, something that I'm watching very closely is evidently. So this shows a huge amount of, of promise as a, a general purpose tool for doing real time and offline machine learning monitoring. So that's generally our pick for, for monitoring to fill that space. And do you find that, that in general, when people you're talking to, or you're advising where, when you suggest kind of this, this stack, do you find people in general are coming with maybe one piece, which they already have, maybe they use airflow for all of their data engineering already, or, or something like that, or is it the case that people are coming with a complete greenfield and you get to yeah, define things a bit more? Sometimes it's complete greenfield, but quite often there is something in place. Now that doesn't necessarily mean we keep the something in place very much depends on the situation. But the, the nice thing is that we kind of have the flexibility, to, you know, if someone says, well, we're already using Zen, we've sorry, we're already using airflow for our training, but what we really need is to, you know, really get a handle on our machine learning pipelines and we can say, okay, that's great. Let's adopt Zen ML as a way to define and manage and handle those pipelines. Let's target your existing airflow, airflow infrastructure for, for running them. And perhaps it's more common that people will just say, well, you know, we're an AWS shop or we're, we work with Google cloud or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and although we do, we are specialized in open source tools, there's no way that we would say to a customer, um, oh, well, no, we don't, we don't do you, we can't use AWS as, as any part of this system. You know, the, the point is that you shouldn't be tied on point is you shouldn't be tied to it. You shouldn't be, um, tied to it in a way that you can't potentially move away if you wanted to. So we usually end with uh, a couple of questions. Our listeners will be familiar with them by now, I hope. First one, and answer this in, in whatever direction you feel is appropriate. Uh, what would be a quick win that someone who, practically speaking, could add to whatever they're doing to make their productionization of models more robust? Focusing on the, on the pipelines. So I suppose every machine learning project implicitly has pipelines because there's a number of steps you go through to prepare data, acquire data, prepare data, train a model, validate it, deploy it, but really thinking long and hard about how those pipelines are organized, what tooling we're using for them, um, how to, how we can automate those pipelines, how we can, you know, make, because ultimately what, where you want to get to is a situation where at any point in time, you could say, I want to get this new model into production, you know, now we should be able to do that. Um, and so having, having robust pipelines is, is the way to get there. Um, you know, preferably, preferably with Zen ML, which I'm not being paid to say, but that is, um, generally, generally the way, the way it goes here. Yeah. I mean, I definitely feel like even completely absent Zen ML pipelines are becoming the, the de facto like abstraction around thinking about some of these things, even if it isn't 
necessarily always referred to in that way, but yeah, the nature of the problem requires that. And the second question, what would be one part of putting a model in production that you think is being underserved or needs a bit more attention by toolmakers in the MLOps space? What are we missing? When I thought about this, the, the first thing that came to mind was model monitoring. I think I, I, I alluded to it earlier as well, that monitoring of models has a unique set of problems that is, are not covered at all by traditional software monitoring systems. And so for me, there's, there's a big gap here that's waiting to be, be disrupted. Um, you know, because right now, if you want to set up successful, uh, successfully set up model monitoring, it requires quite a lot of specialized data science knowledge and it requires it to be tightly coupled to the model. I think that there are various directions in which you can start to come up with genericized versions of this. Um, modular things which can monitor a class of models rather than a single model. Um, so, for instance, if you wanted to say, well, what's a, what does a um, drift detector for images look like? You, you could kind of address that in a somewhat generic way. So that that's where I think you know there's a big tooling gap that that's waiting to be addressed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that it, it does feel like often monitoring tools are a little bit more at the visualization end of the spectrum versus mm -hmm. the the actual logic and context of the hardware. doing ml yeah yeah luckily we have the evidently, evidently. Who are, who seem to yeah. be like heading down that road of tackling that problem so yeah okay well thank you very much for coming on and it was really great to to discuss these things with you and as i said a lot of the things that we talked about i'll link to them in the show notes i definitely would encourage people to check out the fuzzy labs blog and the guides and so on that we mentioned earlier thank you and thanks for having me thank you for listening to this latest episode of pipeline conversations if you enjoyed what you heard please consider giving us a review wherever you get your podcasts it helps us get seen by more people and of course, it's always nice to receive feedback. If you have suggestions for future guests, please send them over to podcast at zenml.io. Thanks. Until next time. <laughs>